guys, today we are going to get ready to do some real chemistry calculations finally by talking about this idea of stoichiometry. While I'm getting us started, you'll hear me click around my pens over here a little bit, what we kind of need to know is that you already know parts of these ideas, um, such as the law of conservation of mass and how to balance equations and what that means. We're just going to add some extra math to it at this point. So, if you don't have handy, you need to get handy a copy of your periodic table and also a calculator because we're going to go back to doing some of those mass to mole kind of conversions that we saw way, 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 way back at the beginning of the year when we were doing um, dimensional analysis. So, now that we know dimensional analysis, we know about equations and how to balance them and how to write them, we need to talk about what we can do with this information. Um, so, kind of a recap of your notes, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Um, what we have not been talking about a whole lot is what these coefficients mean. We know that this 2 means that I have 2 hydrogens, and this 2 means I have 2 waters, but really what we're saying is we have 2 molecules of hydrogen gas. The correct term for that is kind of related to what this is. This is a covalent compound, so I have 1 molecule of oxygen gas to molecules of water. We also know that because of this conversion, if you don't remember Avogadro, now would be a good time to go back and make friends with him. Here's Avogadro's number. We can use Avogadro's number to convert between moles and particles. So basically the long and short of it is if I say two molecules of hydrogen gas, I can also mean two moles of hydrogen gas because of that equation. So we're going to use this mole interpretation, which remembers just the way we measure something, like a dozen, um, to make some predictions about what kinds of things I could expect to get in reactions. The first way that we can do this is using that law of conservation of mass. This is about the third time or so you've seen it this year, so I'm going to breeze right through. So let's scoot down just a little bit here. The law of conservation of mass, if you don't remember, you'll want to know, says that mass cannot be created or destroyed by chemical means. This means we have to do something drastic, like a nuclear change, in order to get this mass to disappear. Otherwise, I'm just changing what it looks like. We can use this information to make some predictions about how much product or how much reactant I would need um, in order to create a certain reaction. Um, we do this by looking at the equation. So in this one we're going to use the equation here with this idea of hydrogen and oxygen making water. So I'm going to copy that guy down here. It's probably not a bad idea to go ahead and get him down here. If you want to leave off the state markers for right now since that's not what we're concerned about that's totally fine. So I want to know um, in this question how many grams of oxygen did I need? So I know that in this equation I have 20 grams of hydrogen gas. If you don't need all of these little extra steps, you could just go get it from your question. 178 grams of water. And the question then is, how much oxygen do I need? Remember that although we're writing this yield sign, we could just write an equal sign right here to do the math. And then this turns into a pretty straight up, not even really algebra problem, it's just a let's figure out what this is. Hopefully we can look at it at this point in our math lives and say that the grams of oxygen needed is equal to 158. Okay. And that is that. This is a, the idea that whatever the mass of the reactants is must be equal to the mass of the products. Well, easy, this is not at all fun or entertaining and this is not where you're going to live your life. So let's look at making this a couple of steps harder. All right, so lots of times, though, we don't give you, of course, because we don't even always know in real life, if I have 100 grams of this and 20 grams of that, what do I make? And I have to look for patterns and relationships, and I'm going to do this using something called stoichiometry. Okay, some things that you need to know about reaction stoic. The first thing is that because of law of conservation of mass, we always assume a reaction proceeds 100% to the product. What this means is whatever I have on the reactant side, I have to get on the product side. I'm not having some kind of error in my calculation or error in my um, experiment and losing something somewhere. Okay, so, uh, Stoic can go between any substances in a reaction. That means I can go between reactants, between products, or from reactants to products. Okay, so we'll show you lots of examples of all of those things. Stoichiometry also helps us to find the percent yield or the um, actual 
yield, what I should get. Let me say that that way. Okay, so I was getting really distracted by the fact that I didn't have a periodic table and I saw this example down here, so I had to stop. So, sorry, you're fine now. So, back to where we were. I was trying to explain to you about what stoichiometry can do. And stoichiometry, mostly like we we're talking about here, is used to, first, to find some percent yields or what I think I should get. Um, what I should make is called the theoretical yield. This is like when we go into the lab and you ask me, hey, is this what I'm supposed to get? And I give you that funny look that says, mm, that's not what I was expecting. That's the theoretical yield. So this is in theory what I should get or what I'm expecting to get. Okay, the actual experimental yield is what really happens once you're in there. As you can probably guess, lots of times there are differences between what I should get in theory and what I do get in life. And we'll spend lots of time over the next couple of units talking about those two different ideas, how to calculate them, and what to do once I know which is which. So, we have to follow some steps to solve our stoic problems. Yes, I expect you to do all the steps. No, I don't care if you don't want to do the steps. Yes, I will take off points if you don't do the steps. So, here we go. Here are your steps. Every single time, you need to get your balanced reaction written. Focus on this balanced part. You've got to balance it first. You've got to make a map. So like this, X marks the spot, right? We need to know where we're going. So if I start here, I need to know how the heck am I going to get to whatever it is that I want to solve for. And then you have to show your work. Just telling me here's my map and oh, by the way, the answer is 12 does me no good. It does you no good. In chemistry, we always, always show our work. You're going to love it. It's going to be great. It's my favorite unit, by the way, if you can't tell. There are several different kinds of stoichiometry problems. The first one, the most straightforward one, is just from moles to moles. So the way that we work these problems is to use the coefficients. The coefficients will provide us a mole ratio to convert from one substance to another. Okay? It's basically the bridge, or it's how we get there. So this is my bridge, and I'll show you what that looks like on your map in just a second. The mole ratio is always the ratio of the coefficients. This is why balancing is important. If you don't write your equation correctly and don't get it balanced correctly, now you're in trouble. So, oops, important. We want to be really careful that we're writing exactly what the question says and balancing really carefully. Okay. All right, so let's look at this first kind. We are using the synthesis of water equation again, so I'm going to scratch that on here real quick. Remember, our step is to get our balanced equation written. That's the first thing we've got to do. So here we go, 2H2O. Again, right now I'm not really concerned about the states. We can leave them off. If I ask, expect you from now on to write them, I'll let you know. Um, then the next thing we need to do is make a map. So I need to know what do I know to start and where am I supposed to get finished. So let me do this in a different color to give my map. I'm going to scoot up just a little bit. It's bothering me that I don't have any space to write. So, what I know from my question, I have 32.38 moles of oxygen gas, and I need to know, determine how many moles of water. So, this is what I need to know. I need to know the number of moles specifically. What I do know to get there is that I have 32.38 moles of oxygen gas. So I'm going to do this. As a habit, I always draw mine with some little sticks for my bridges. My bridge is my ratio that gets me across. We'll, when the problems get harder, we'll use these sticks to write ourselves little love notes and friendly reminders. But for right now, I need to know that this is my mole ratio. It's how I get from oxygen to water. You can abbreviate that MR if you want to, but your map should show what you're doing. So give me all the steps. This information, by the way, in case you don't remember, you don't have to write it, but love notes are helpful. This comes from the coefficient, C-I-E-N-T-S. Remember from up here in our notes, that ratio always comes from those coefficients. So now we just set it up and solve. So let me grab another color. Let's see what's going on here. So step three says calculate. So what I need to know is the number of moles of water and I find that by doing what my problem says. So I start with what I know. I know I have 32.38 moles of oxygen. Yes, you have to label it. No, I don't care that it takes a long time. Yes, you're expected to put every single compound at this point. Yes, you will lose points if you choose not to. 
If you have questions about that, you should see a chem teacher. As a general habit, I write my uh, dimensional analysis this way. If you have a different way that you want to do it, that's completely fine. Just make sure that the steps are the same and that I can see what you're doing. So I start with what I know, and then I need to know, remember, way back from dimensional analysis, I need to get rid of what I don't want, so I need these moles of oxygen to cancel out, and I want to know about moles of water. So I need moles of oxygen to cancel out, so I put moles of oxygen on the bottom of my fraction or under my bar, however you set that up. And what I want to know is moles of water. To get the numbers that go here, this is my coefficient ratio. So I go look at oxygen. There is no number, so I have a coefficient of 1. And the coefficient in front of my water is 2. From here, all I need to do is do the division we learned, or the multiplication and division, I'm sorry, we learned during dimensional analysis. So I'm going to multiply straight across and then divide. This time, easy peasy, because I have that 1 on the bottom, and I get 64.76 moles of hydrogen. Oops, yep, sorry. Got all confused with that hydrogen and oxygen. Moles of water. Yes, you have to label down here as well. Also, be really careful in your answers about sig figs. Your sig fig should always come from your starting number, so this should come from your question. We do not use coefficient ratios for sig figs. Sig figs always come from what you know, what you were given in your question. So this is four sig figs, so my answer will have four sig figs. We do not use coefficient ratios, we use the number from the question. All right, so this is kind of a long lecture. I'm going to stop us right here, give you a second to stretch, pause this video, make a new video actually, because I don't think I can go over 15 minutes and we're at like 12. And then we will take a quick break, come back, and do some more complicated questions.